All right, so uh, it's a, with a great pleasure I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Luciana Ferrer is a researcher from the Computer Science Institute from the National Scientific and Technical Research Council, CONICET, from Universidad de Buenos Aires, Argentina. Prior to her current position, Luciana worked at the, uh, at the Speak Technology and Research Laboratory, SRI International, in the United States. Her current uh, research interests include speaker and language identification, mental state detection, pronunciation scoring for second language learning. So Luciana received her bachelor's degree from the Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina uh, and her PhD from Stanford University in the United States. Please all welcome Luciana. Okay, so um, the introduction was very complete, so I don't have to say anything more, I think. Um, just to reinforce, my area of research is uh, on speech processing, machine learning applied to speech processing, but I won't be talking about the application today. I'll be talking about um, machine learning fundamentals, and in particular, one aspect of uh, machine learning development, which I think it's very essential and it's probably underrated in some of the machine learning courses. So I think it's worth an hour of your time. Uh, can I get some water? Pasito de agua. Ah. Okay, so I wanted to start with a quote that I think is very um, a nice summary of what is gone. Is it? Ah, okay, yes, good. Okay, so a quote from a paper from Domingos um, that I think is very a very nice summary of what we think of when we think of machine learning. He says, farmers combine seeds with nutrients to grow crops, while learners, and I think he's talking about us machine learners, combine knowledge with data to grow programs. And basically that has all the essential components of what I think when I think of machine learning, which is the data, of course, but also the knowledge or more generally the assumptions that we make that are necessary to combine that data with this knowledge and then that becomes a program, a program that is grown because it's not an explicit set of code lines. All right, so just to put that into pictures, um, we start with training data. Those, this is the training pipeline for supervised learning. I'm going to be talking exclusively about supervised learning here. Uh, we start with training data. We do a process that is feature extraction. Sometimes that part is actually integrated with the model training, but um, let's talk about the classic view for now. Uh, that feature extraction is basically already showing or in, in integrating your assumptions on what is important about the training data or your task. Uh, because you've talked to an expert and they told you what's important or because you know a lot about the task from literature or because you know yourself, uh, your data very well and you know what's important. So that basically converts your samples into a set of numbers and those numbers are what you model uh, the last stage and you have of course you need the training labels for that and you need a metric which is going to measure how well the model is getting close to your data to the training data how well the model is representing the training data and in this whole process there are these implicit inputs which are the assumptions or what Domingo is called is calling uh, knowledge 
um, which is essential for this whole thing to work. You may assume more or less, you may have very strong assumptions or very weak assumptions, but there's always some assumptions in the features you extract and in the architecture of your model. If it's a generative model, you assume just a family of functions that uh, describe your distribution of your data. If it's a discriminative model, then if it's, for example, a DNN, you have a certain set of architectures that you're going to explore. And they're not all of the possible architectures. They are just some family. So those are the assumptions that you're making. There's also assumptions in the training metric because that's the thing you think uh, better will better optimize your model. So after the whole thing is done, you end up with a model which, unless you're doing Bayesian learning, basically replaces your training data. So the model is supposed to contain all the information you care about that it's in the training data. And then you throw away the data, unless you're doing Bayesian modeling, and you use it to do your scoring. Basically, you feed it test data, you do the same process of doing feature extraction, and then you score. And that's a very generic name for whatever your model needs to do to generate outputs. And these outputs are what the model thinks about your test data. Again, very generic. I'm not committing to any type of model here. Is it too loud? No? Okay. I hear myself very loud. Okay. So once you have the scores, and this is the part that I'm, I'll focus on for the rest of the talk, is you need, once you're doing development, you need to measure how well you're doing, the performance of your system. And that requires the labels, of course, of your test data. And it also requires a decision on what, what is important to you, what is the metric that you want to measure. Um, so that will be the focus of the talk. And why did I decide to focus on evaluation? Well, machine learning development research very heavily relies on the evaluation methodology. The problem is that we usually ignore it a lot in, in the literature. But basically, the whole development process, the, your choice of features, models, hyperparameters, everything you do during development is relying on some metric or bunch of metrics that you decide how to compute. That's the evaluation methodology. And if that process, the process of evaluation, has issues, then the conclusions will also have issues. And if the evaluation methodology is weak somehow for some reason, and I think I'll, I'll try to explain all the many re ways in which it can go wrong, um, then it actually is much easier to get gains than if you do it right. It's kind of counterintuitive because if you do modeling wrong, then you probably won't get any gain and you won't get a paper out of it. But if you do evaluation wrong, you may get a paper out of it, but it will be a meaningless paper because it won't generalize to any other evaluation methodology, any other data set. I'm saying if something is wrong in the process. So the talk will be about all the many things that can go wrong, um, starting with data. Then I'll talk about how to make optimal decisions, because I need that to explain the issues of in metrics. And then um, half of the talk, more or less, will focus on calibration. Sorry, how do I do this? OK. So let's start with the data. This is probably very obvious to all of you if you've gone to any course in machine learning, but I want to emphasize how important it is to know the data. Especially when you start with a new data set you've never seen before. Um, the first thing is listen to the data if, if there are audio samples or look at the images if there are images. Or if it's impossible to uh, understand the data with your senses, then create statistics, uh, look at distributions of the features, look for outliers. And one very nice and useful thing to do is run a baseline system. It doesn't have to be the state of the art, just something that is easy to run, that you know works reasonably well. And look for cases where the system is extremely sure about the wrong thing. It gave the wrong answer, but very sure about it. Those are very likely to be errors in the data. Um, 
Not always, sometimes it's a problem with the data, with the system, but in many cases it's a problem with the data itself. Labeling errors, those are, at least in speech processing, they're very common. Things that they're labeled as one thing and you listen to it and not at all. Or with the data itself. So again, in speech processing, you're supposed to be working with speech. And we very often get samples, audio samples, that don't contain speech. So sometimes they don't co even contain audio. They're just zeros. So you run your system there, and it gives you an error, of course, because there's nothing there. So it's not that you have to get rid of those samples, because they may happen in the wild, too, when you deploy the system. But you need to know what to do with them. You need to be aware that they exist and be able to maybe evaluate on them separately. And then finally, one uh, essential stage here at the very beginning of the development is to figure out whether your samples are independent and identically distributed or not. This is a very strong assumption we make in all the stages of the machine learning pipeline in general, and it's very lightly made, and in general, it's not true. In many data sets, this is not the case. S and it actually affects uh, very much the evaluation part, much more than the others, because you can actually get away with doing IID modeling, but you cannot get away with doing IID evaluation. And I'll explain examples of where things can go wrong in the next couple of slides. OK, so let's say we have a large data set. Um, we got lucky, and we have a lot of data. And we want to split it to do our development. So we take some part, a big part, for training the models. We take a smaller part for doing the validation, which is basically hyperparameter tuning. And then we need to leave one part, usually similar to the validation in size, which is for testing, the final testing of the system. And that is hidden until the very end. Once you've done all your development, you uncover it, and you evaluate there. And this is important because if you don't do it this way, then, and you keep looking at testing, picking into what the performance is, then you're cheating because you've actually optimized on the data that is supposed to be a fair um, evaluator of the performance you'll see in the wild. Only, it will only be fair if you haven't seen it during development. So really hide it until the end. Now, that's if you have plenty of data. If you don't, and uh, then you need to do cross-validation. And that's uh, this process where you split your data in faults, and you test on one fault and train on the others, and then you switch it around until you are able to evaluate on the whole set. This is good, but it's equivalent to having these two sets. It's, you still need a test set to do fair evaluation. Now, they, that may be impossible if you have very little data. Um, but in that case, you need to be aware that the performance that you're getting with cross-validation is actually optimistic, because you've actually done the development on that same set. So, and here at the bottom paper, he has uh, one method of trying to avoid this overfitting when you do cross-validation. And I won't go into it. It's complicated. All right. So. Let's say we have a lot of data, just to simplify, and we want to divide it into train, validation, and test. How do we divide it? One, one way, the more common one, is randomly. Shuffle all your data and divide, uh, say, 80, 10, 10%. This is really only correct if in some cases. So if your data is IID, then fine, you can do randomly. And in other cases, even if it's not IID, you may be able to do uh, random splits. But if you want your system to work on conditions that it hasn't seen in training, and I'm calling condition very loosely, things that uh, introduce correlations in your data. So for an example, again, on speech, let's say we want to detect emotions. And we have a database where there's 10 speakers but lots of samples from each of them. So the speaker identity introduces correlations across all the samples that belong to the same speaker that you have to take into account when you do evaluation. And hopefully when you do modeling too, but in evaluation is essential. 
So the, if you want to, your system to be able to detect emotions on speakers that you haven't seen in training, then those, that same criteria has to be used when you split. So you have to split by speaker. You, you have to keep some speakers for training, different set of speakers for validation, and a different set of speakers for testing. So that the performance that you estimate on validation and on test is actually a good assessment of what you will get with unseen speakers, which is what will happen in the wild. And I'm saying the wild, meaning when you deploy the system. Um, now, ignoring the correlations would result in, for example, overestimating the performance that the system will give in the wild. Because it will work, the system will work better on speakers it has seen, of course. It, it knows a lot more about them. So if you evaluate on system it has seen, then you will think you, you will do much better than, than you actually will. And you may also select a system that is more complex than it has to be. Because a more complex system may overfit those speakers better, and that's advantageous for a system that will actually test on the same speakers. But that won't happen in the real life. So you actually have to probably, most likely, choose a simpler system for cases where the, the overfitting doesn't really help. It's not an advantage. All right, so to finish up with the data issues, if you have small data sets, then it's very essential to consider statistical significance. Um, and I, I won't go into all the many different ways of doing statistical tests, but what, what I do want to emphasize is that this issue of correlations is, is again very important in this stage. So if, if you have a small set and you have correlations and you don't take those correlations into account when you compute the statistical significance, then you will get an overestimation of or underestimation of the p-values or the confidence interval. So here is an example. On, this is a data set that has many, many samples for very few speakers. So the correlations are very widespread. Now, if you run this joint bootstrap, which is here in this paper, um, without assuming or without knowing the identity of the speaker, without using that to compute the inf interval, you get a small interval the blue one. While if you consider the speaker identity, you get twice as big. So the, over, the underestimation of the confidence interval here, it's quite uh, severe. And with this approach, the bootstrap is actually quite easy to consider correlation. So that's one uh, reasonable way to go. All right, so let's go back to the pipeline. We, we've talked about data, now we, we are gonna talk about how to compute performance. And in order to compute performance, you, we are starting from scores, so let's talk about how to make optimal decisions. And I'm assuming that the system is outputting posteriors. And these are the posteriors of the classes given the samples. These are not the posteriors that they are more commonly used in Bayesian learning that are the posterior of the parameters. These are posteriors of the classes. I'm just saying this for the Bayesian learners among you. Can you raise your hands? Who, know, who does Bayesian learning here? Oh, a bunch of you. Okay. So for you, <laughs> these are not the posteriors you are used to thinking of. These are posteriors of classes given samples. And this is usually what the discriminative systems give at the output, right? So what do these posteriors mean? They, they measure the uncertainty of the system for the sample, for the given x. And the uncertainty of the system means if the system gives a posterior of 0.7, then it thinks that it will be right 70% of the times. 70% of the times that it says 0.7, it should be right. And if that is happening, then the system is calibrated. That's the definition of calibration. Now, this is a nice diagram to put this more concretely. So let's say we run the system on a bunch of data. We obtain decisions by the system, which usually are the maximum posterior decisions, and we record the output of the system for the, post for the decision that it gave us. It decided class C with a, pro uh, with a posterior of 0.7. We record all those numbers. 
we bin them in 10 bins in this case. And then we compute for each of the samples that fell into each bin the accuracy of the system. If the accuracy coincides with the posterior, then the system is perfect. It knows exactly what it's doing. And that happens in this case fairly well. So for example, in this bin where the system output 0 0.9, between 0.8 and 0.9 of posterior, its accuracy was a little higher than it thought. So it was actually a, a modest system that didn't want to be too sure, but it was actually better than it thought it was, 90% uh, in this case. Well, well, the perfect calibration is actually the diagonal, right? So now modern DNNs are not well calibrated in general. I've been seeing this in many, many different tasks and experiments. And this is a nice paper that actually put, uh, put it in, in experiments in, in a nice way. Um, this is on CIFAR 100, which is the image classification, 100 different classes. And they show this same plot as before. An old DNN from 98, this is a CNN, that actually is pretty well calibrated. Um, and then they compare that result with a more modern uh, ResNet, which is horribly calibrated. It's in, in the same bin as before, between 0.8 and 0.9. It, it should have been right 85% of the times, but it was right less than 50. So the output of the system is actually meaningless. It thinks it's going to be right a lot of the times, and it's actually not. On the other hand, the actual network is very good in terms of error. So if you look at the numbers there, it's 45% before, and now it's 30. So it improved a lot. So these are kind of two separate issues on a system. One is discrimination, which in this case is measured by the error. And the other issue is calibration. And they're kind of independent. One can improve, and the other one can go bad, and the other way around. And we are usually measuring discrimination only, or the total cost. And I, I'm going into explaining all this. OK, so first of all, why do we think that the output of a DNN should be posteriors to begin with? I mean, I've been assuming that in, in what I showed. And in Google's papers, that's what they assume. Well, we train them usually when we are doing classification, we train them with cross-entropy. And we, the output of the system, first of all, is a softmax. So the softmax is between 0 and 1 and sums to 1. So it, the outputs, this is 1 per class, they already have the property that they should have to be probability distributions. So we set them to be probability distributions. Now, why do we think they are actually posteriors for the class given the sample? That's because we train them with cross-entropy. And cross-entropy is this very simple function, which probably all of you know, but let me review it. Um, it takes the output corresponding to each sample for the true class for each sample. So this f of CK is the output of the system for the true class of the sample. If that is 1, then the logarithm will be 0. Then if that happens for all samples, the cross entropy will be 0, minimum. And if that's not the case, then the, the cross entropy will be larger than 0. Now, it can be shown, and I won't show it, of course, that this uh, cross entropy is actually minimized when the output of the system coincides with the posterior of the classes given the samples. So that's why we think that the output of our DNN should be a calibrated posterior. It's not actually happening, as I showed before from Google's paper, and that's mostly because of overfitting. So our model is, models are overfitting posterior, um, overfitting the cross entropy because it actually benefits the error. So what comes out of the models, the best possible model is not the best in terms of calibration, it's the best in terms of error discrimination. So yes, if we train a model to optimize cross entropy, we expect it to output posteriors. That may not happen, but it, we expect it to. OK, so 
Let's assume for now, for a couple of slides, that we do have posteriors, that we have a well-calibrated well system. So how do we make optimal decisions in that case? One definition of optimal is to uh, maximize the probability of correctness. That's Bayesian theory, right? We, this probability of correctness is a sum over all the true classes, the, all the possible classes of the, the conditional probability of correctness, so conditional to each class. And the sum, the weight for the sum, is the prior probability of class of the class I. Now this is maximized when we choose the class that maximizes the posterior. So this is the very common rule of run your system, get your output, it, decide the class that gives you the maximum output. Now, this maximum posterior decision is not always the best thing to do. It's the most default thing to do, but it's not always the best. One case where it's not the best is when the priors in testing are different than in training. And uh, this is a very common scenario. So, for example, in medical data, it, the, they, the experiments are usually designed so that the one class is mostly balanced with the other class. So you have the same number of samples of controls and targets. And there are many other cases where this is the case too. And maybe even if that's not the case, if you have very imbalanced data because you collected it from Twitter, let's say you collected a lot of tweets, you have the actual frequency of classes. But then when you train your system, you don't like the imbalance, so you compensate for it. So you messed up with the priors again. You've, you have done it on purpose to benefit the training. So that actually means, because of base rule, that the posteriors that come out of the system will be affected directly. They are proportional to the prior that you've seen in training. You can't get away from that. The posteriors that come out of the system are directly affected by the either the true priors or if you have mess, messed with the objective functions so that you balance the classes, then those are the effective priors. Whatever you've done, that affects directly the output of the system. So if those priors that you fed into the training are not the same that you expect to see in the wild, then the posteriors that you make, the decisions that you make based on this, these posteriors will be suboptimal. And it could be wildly suboptimal if the priors are very, very different. And another case where the maximum posterior decisions are not optimal is when the costs of making one type of error are very different from the other type of error. And this is one very clear case where you have, you want to detect a tumor in an imaging from the brain. The cost of not seeing the tumor when it's there is much, much higher than saying, I think there's a tumor, let's run more exams. Let's run more exams, it's, it's horrible for the person that receives that. But the other option is somebody will probably die because you have said there is no tumor when there was one. So you better err for the conservative side in this case. And again, in, if, the, if that is a case of uh, uneven costs, then max posterior decisions are suboptimal. So the right thing to optimize for these cases is a cost. You want to minimize the cost, where you have a weighted sum of all the possible types of errors. So this is the probability of error that corresponds to deciding J when the true class was I. And you have a separate cost decided by you or your user or the expert in the field uh, of what is more important, basically. It's rule of thumb, more or less, I don't know, 10 times, a, a thousand times, but it's better than nothing. It's better than saying even in the, ca in the case of the tumor, for example. And then you have the expected priors. And those you may be able to measure pretty well. But these are the priors that you expect to see in the wild. They may not be the training priors or not even the validation or test priors. They are what you think you will see when you deploy the system. And what's minimizing this cost is this sum, doesn't matter if you understand it deeply, but the point is that you need this thing, which is the likelihood. 
of the sample given the class. And I put the wiggle here because this is actually the likelihood on the test data. We always assume in machine learning that we can actually get it from the trained data. Basically, that's what machine learning does, is get some data, assume that the distributions generalize to unseen data, unless you're doing adaptation and a million other things, but in the basic machine learning setup. So we'll assume that, that we can get those likelihoods from the model. And, but the thing is, we don't have the likelihoods because the model, our model, I'm assuming, is discriminative. Right? We, I started saying the scores are posteriors. We don't have the generative model. So we need to get the likelihoods from the posteriors, which is this is what the model gives us, the posterior of the class given the sample. And these priors, which are the priors that you fed into the training process. Maybe the true priors or maybe artificial priors that you changed with the objective function. Whatever that is, you have to get rid of it so that you get likelihoods. And then you would need, in theory, this P of X. But this P of X is a scale that doesn't depend on the class. So to make this optimal decision here, you don't need P of X. You are fine with these two, luckily, because there's no way to get P of X unless you do generative modeling. So to summarize, what ideally the model should give as output is this vector of likelihoods for each of the classes. We are used to getting the vector of posteriors. But if you take the vector of posteriors, I'm doing all log because it's much nicer, um, and subtract the prior for each class, and then subtract the log of p, then you get the likelihoods. Right? It's the same base rule that I showed before, but in the log domain. Now, you can actually, as I said, get rid of p of x, because it won't change any decisions. And if you have that, then you can make optimal decisions for any cost function. And note that this vector is actually in an n minus one dimensional space because of the fact that these posteriors sum to one and the priors two. So if you have n minus one of them, you can compute the nth one. Now in binary classification, you would have a vector of two values. But those two values are dependent on each other. One is a function of the other. So by subtracting the two, you get a nice summary of that vector, which is all you need to make optimal decisions. And that's basically what we call, and everybody uh, uses in many different disciplines, is the log likelihood ratio. So this log likelihood ratio, you can compute it from the posteriors and the priors. The same as before, the P of X goes away because it's a ratio. Um, and given the LLR, all you need to do is threshold it. So compare, compute the LLR, compare with the threshold, and you are done making your decision. Everything above is one class, everything below is the other class. And the threshold is if your input, your scores are calibrated, then the optimal way of making decisions for a certain cost function is given by this threshold. So if you define a cost function, you know your output uh, is calibrated, then this is the best you can do. It, and let's see it in a picture. So if you have LLRs from a system, and you plot the distributions for each of the two classes, so this would be histograms, but I'm smoothing them out because it's much nicer to see them. So it's basically the LLRs that you found for one class the LLRs that you found for the other class. If these are perfectly separated, like the two curves are very well separated, then you may be able to make perfect decisions. Put the threshold in the middle, separate the two classes perfectly. That usually doesn't happen, like in this case. So let's say these are calibrated. If you have equal costs and equal priors, which is basically maximizing the probability of correctness, it degenerates to that, then the optimal threshold is zero, which again degenerates to the max posterior decision because LLR of zero corresponds to a posterior of 0.5, which is, in binary case, max posterior. So that's fine for equal post and equal priors. But if the cost of one class is 10 times higher than the cost of the other, then you need to 
shift the threshold. So the optimal threshold is no longer the max posterior decision. What you need to do is compare the LLR with 2.3 in this case, which is just making this little calculation here. And it's intuitive. Basically, here I'm saying that the cost of deciding when one, when the actual class was zero, is 10 times higher than the other way around. So you don't want to make mistakes on class zero, basically. That's what this is saying. Um, so you need to move the threshold to the right so that you're sure that you will get all the class zeros correctly classified. And class one will suffer. That's life. Trade-off. Uh, and if the errors are the other way around, the costs are the other way around, then th the threshold goes to the other side. It's symmetric. That's the nice thing about taking the logarithm. This won't be the case if, if we were plotting the likelihood ratio. It wouldn't be symmetric. All right. So to recap the last few slides, not, I'm not finishing yet. I don't know what, how am I going on time? Good. OK, so a model trained with cross entropy aims to output class posteriors. Those class posteriors will be proportional to the priors that you've seen in training. And the priors may be the true priors or the effective priors that you feed because you are messing with the objective function. So in order to make your system independent of that, of those priors, it's nicer to output relative log likelihoods if it's multi-class or LLRs if it's binary. With those things, you can make optimal decisions for any cost function that you care about. Uh, and this, of course, these decisions are only optimal if those were actually posterior. If they're not, then they won't be optimal. So let's look at what happens then. So the standard ways of evaluating binary classification. You, uh, we always assume the system outputs a score that we threshold. So we compare the score with the threshold. Everything above is one class. Everything below is the other class, even if it's not an LLR. Even if we're running an SVM, we do that. Um, so once you've made the decisions with whatever threshold you've chosen, you can compute the cost with this uh, weighted sum. So you have errors of one kind and errors of the other kind. And again, I'm showing the distribution of the scores for the two classes. And the colors coincide with what tail you're measuring. So this is this error. And this is this error, right? After you've chosen a threshold. You can compute the cost very easily. Now, you're committing to a threshold there. If you don't want to commit to a threshold, you can sweep it around for all the possible values and plot an ROC curve, which here, it may not look familiar because I flipped the y-axis because I like the symmetry here. It's one error. <laughs> I'm an engineer. One error versus the other error, right? And the other nice thing about this plot is that the diagonal here, where the diagonal crosses the ROC, is the equal error rate. So it's the point where the two areas, the orange and the blue, are the same size. All right, so those are the most standard metrics. There's also recall, precision, sensitivity, specificity. They're all very similar in, in what they measure. Now let's look at the effect of miscollaboration in these metrics. Um, Let's assume we have equal costs and equal priors for simplicity. So we choose a threshold of zero if we think that the LLRs are calibrated. That's the optimal threshold only if the LLRs are calibrated. This is a case where they are. So it looks good. That threshold looks good. Now, if it's not, where I just tampered with the scores and shifted them to the left, then the cost of choosing the threshold will be much higher than it has to be because you incur all this additional loss here, the, the orange stuff above the blue, that is not needed. You could have chosen this threshold in the middle. Now, if you compute the equal error rate, then you won't notice this issue, because the equal error rate adapts the threshold to the point where the two areas are the same. And as long as the transformation between one score and the other is monotonic, then there will always be a threshold that gives the same equal error rate as before. So equal error rate is only measuring the discrimination power of your system. 
basically how separated the, the two curves are. But it's not measuring how well these uh, scores are as, as actual posteriors. So just to reiterate what I just said. Discrimination is how well the scores are separated. Calibration is whether these scores can be interpreted in, uh, probabilistically. And they are re really two very different things that go their own track. You can have a very good system in terms of discrimination that is horrible in terms of calibration and the other way around. Discrimination is actually not changed if we transform the scores with a monotonic transformation. So here is what shows that. If you have some score distribution with some threshold, and you apply a monotonic transformation, then that will transform your scores. Here is just a scale and shift. But you can transform this, the threshold the same way, with the same function, and that will give you exactly the same error as before. So that's discrimination. In this case, calibration was completely messed up by the transformation. So a monotonic transformation preserves discrimination power, but it could mess up or fix calibration. So how do we figure out what, what, how much of the error from our system, if we are measuring cost, comes from discrimination and how much comes from calibration? It's quite easy, actually, surprisingly easy. So we can compute this, the actual cost, which is set the optimal, the, what, what base theory would tell us is the optimal threshold if the score was calibrated, and measure the cost, right? And now measure the minimum possible cost that you would get by sweeping the threshold to find the, the optimal C. So sweep the threshold, find all the possible Cs, and choose the threshold that gave you the minimum C. That's the C min. And now do the difference between those two. And that gives you the calibration, the miscalibration cost. So how much larger your cost was because your scores were miscalibrated. Now, this process that I gave you is basically measuring the miscalibration for one single operating point. The, the operating point is basically your choice of priors and costs in the cost function. But we can do the same for the whole spectrum of costs. And that is done actually by our beloved, beloved cross entropy. Um, the we tampered with the cross entropy a bit so that we can infuse the priors that we expect to see in the wild. So this is really the same cross-entropy that we saw before, the logarithm of the output of the system. Let's assume it's a posterior um, for each of the two classes. So separated by class, divided by the count of each of the classes, and reweighted by the, this prior that we expect to see in the wild. This is the this is not the prior in training, and it may not even be the prior in validation or in testing. It's what you think you will see in real life. And the posteriors are calculated with the likelihood ratio and the priors using Bayes' rule, with the same priors as here, right, to be consistent. Now, uh, the beautiful thing about this, and it can be shown, but I won't show it, is that this cross entropy is actually an integral over the whole family of possible cost functions. It's, it's beautiful proof, it com a little complicated. And it's in the top, top paper here. OK. Um, again, we can decompose the cross entropy in discrimination and calibration. It's very similar to what we did with the cost. It's, again, a subtraction between the true cross entropy, so the actual, the one that you get with the scores without doing anything, and a minimum cross entropy which is obtained by uh, applying a, a non-parametric monotonic transformation to the scores. So you squeeze, you widen, you shift your scores. As long as you don't change the rank of the scores, that's monotonic. And there's an algorithm to do that, which is called Pool Adjacent Violators Algorithm, PAV, um, which does that. So we know how to obtain the best possible cross entropy. And that subtraction will give us how much higher the cross entropy is because the scores are miscalibrated. Now, for multi class, I, everything before was binary. 
for multi-class, we can compute cost and prior weighted cross entropy trivially, basically the same expressions. Uh, what is not trivial is to obtain this minimum for basically there is no path algorithm for more than one dimension. We don't know what's the best we can get. Still, maybe we will know eventually, somebody will come up with an algorithm, but for now, we don't know how to obtain that minimum. And what we do is basically do our best with some transformation that is monotonic, but it's not the very best possible. Okay, so you're probably wondering if this matters to you in your problem specific task or whatever you're working on. If the problem is binary and you only care about one specific metric, recall or F1, then you may not care about calibration. Basically what you need to be aware, uh, aware of is that the optimal threshold, the theoretical one, or your default that the algorithm gives you, sklearn gives you, that may not be the best threshold for your problem. If the scores are miscalibrated, then it won't be. So what the way to solve this is basically do what I did for the cost, minimum cost, sweep the threshold, compute the metric, whatever that is, and choose the threshold that minimizes that metric. And it's basically you've done calibration for one operating point, the one you care about. And yet that's fine if that's the problem. But in many other cases, you do care like if you're doing multi-class calibration and you're choosing max posteriors, implicitly calibration is bothering you if there is a problem, right? It may not bother you even if it's miscalibrated like we saw in the example from Guo's paper. The system was miscalibrated but it was working great. Maybe it could work better if we calibrate it. In his case, the, in that paper, they showed that calibration was not a problem for the max posterior decisions. But there are other cases where you may care, uh, like for example, if you don't know the cost function ahead of time. You, you cannot commit to a metric while you're doing development. Because for example, you don't know the costs that the doctor will want to put into making the wrong decision, right? So in that case, you want to serve the user with a score that they can decide after the fact what the cost and the priors are, and then the threshold will be the optimal threshold, automatically, magically defined. Uh, and another reason to output calibrated stuff is to have something interpretable. Like, for example, if I want to report a confidence, again, to a doctor, say the system thinks 0.8% of the times he will be right. You need to be sure that that is true. That 80% of the times the system will be right. And another nice case is where the system is very uncertain about the decision. In some very important applications, you may not want to make a decision at all. You may want to ask for more information. So if the LLR was zero or very close to zero, then it means the system has no clue about the answer. Maybe in some applications, the good, the good thing to do is ask for more information, like in biometrics applications, if you're looking for fingerprints, access. Well, ask for another fingerprint, it's not so, so bad. Okay, so how do we fix calibration? Do I have time? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> so a simple approach to fixing calibration after the fact, so assuming the system has been trained and you don't want to tamper with it because it's working very well in terms of discrimination. You just want to fix calibration because you want, for example, interpretable outputs. Well, then you run that system on some held out data that has to have been unseen during training, unless you trust fully that you haven't overfitted the training data and then you can use the training data. But if there's any chance that you may have overfitted, then held out data is better. Run it, generate the scores, and then find an invertible transformation of those scores that will minimize a proper scoring rule. And a proper scoring rule is some, an objective function that encourages the outputs to be well calibrated. So course entropy is one of them, but there are many others. Breer rule is another one. Uh, so any one of them will, uh, in principle, give you a calibrated output if you haven't, again, overfit it. But these are very small models. So for binary classification, you have just one W and one B. It's very hard to overfit that. 
two values. And you want it to be invertible again because you don't want to change discrimination, right? You trust your system in terms of that. You trust that the system will do the best it can. The information is there. All you want to change is the way the information is shown to the user. All right. So for binary classification, uh, there's a single score. So invertible implies monotonic. So that makes things very simple. If we have uh, well-behaved scores, like the ones here that look kind of Gaussian, they're nice, uh, then you can do just a linear and a fine transformation and train it with linear logistic regression, which is basically cross-entropy minimization. Um, that will give you posteriors again. So you again need to get rid of the priors that you train that model with, so that you get likelihood ratios. Um, and here I'm just showing a case, a fake case, uh, where I fixed calibration and the cross entropy went from being very high to being this low. And this is just to show the comparison between calibrating with this uh, linear function with the minimum possible uh, cross entropy that you can get you with this PAV algorithm that I mentioned before. So in this case, where the scores look very Gaussian and nice, linear is very close to optimal. Now for multi-class classification, there's again, there's no PAV in this case, but we can do stuff. We, as long as it's monotonic, then we are doing calibration. And we start usually with raw log posteriors or log likelihoods. And one very simple approach is to multiply by a W single score, and that's what uh, Guo does in his paper, and he shows that it's actually achieving almost perfect calibration with a single parameter. That doesn't change my posterior decision, so the error will be the same as before, the calibration. Now, there are other ways of doing um, calibration for multi-class classification that do change max posterior decisions. One is this. Uh, the same as before, but adding a bias that depends on the class, so that changes the decisions. And the other one is take each lambda, each log posterior, as, a, as its own detector for one of the classes, so one versus all, and calibrate that, and do that for every class, and then normalize again and hope for the best. It, it works well, actually. OK, so to recap the last few slides, so calibrate it likelihood ratios or relative log likelihoods, depending on binary versus multi-class, they're more flexible and informative than the raw scores that come out of the system, if you can trust that they are calibrated. The problem is that we usually don't evaluate calibration, so we don't know if our system is outputting something meaningful or not, because equal error rate or ROC or mean costs, they only evaluate discrimination performance. And the total cost, so if you're computing just accuracy or total cost, that gives you a compound of both. In, in order to separate the effect of both, you can do this very simple computation of computing the total, computing the minimum, subtracting. And fixing calibration is usually easy. I shouldn't say ever, uh, always, because if you have lots of classes, then it's not so easy anymore. Um, but in binary, it's quite easy. Just run assist on some held out data and then uh, estimate the parameters of a monotonic transformation. And there's usually very few parameters unless you're going for a very complex transform. Okay, so in summary, uh, I strongly believe that this is the first focus that one should have when you start working with a new task or a new data set. Focus on the evaluation methodology first, before doing any feature extraction before, do just figure out how you're going to measure whether you're doing well or not. But try to do it in a robust way so that you don't get to easy conclusions that are then not going to generalize to other data sets or even to other ways of measuring performance. So among many other things that I'm probably missing, uh, good evaluation practices include Avoiding small data sets if at all possible. That's, of course, obvious. Sometimes it's not possible, but in that case, it's 
very essential to use statistical significance for comparisons, because you may think you're doing better and it was just noise. Uh, but making sure that the validation and test splits are as different to the wild data as uh, the training set will be. And this is kind of subtle, but it's very important. You may overestimate your performance by a lot if you don't do it right, if there are strong correlations in the data. Of course, never making the development decisions on the test data, because you want the test data to be a good representation of unseen data. If you keep developing and optimizing on the test data, then that's not unseen anymore. And then defining meaningful metrics, and Guillermo mentioned this too, which reflect what you care about. So if you compute only equal error rate, then that doesn't really reflect the actual performance that you will see in the wild, because equal error rate is not achievable. It's a threshold that is set on the test data itself. It's a nice metric, it's useful because it measures discrimination, but it shouldn't be the only one, because you will never achieve equal error rate. The, the threshold, you will have to choose it on some other data. You could choose the threshold for the equal error rate, but then you have to measure something else when you use that threshold. See what happens. Don't measure equal error rate again. Um, and then I think a very, very good thing to do is always keep a few metrics and in, in mind when you're optimizing. Because optimizing a single metric, it's actually quite easy. If you have three or four of them, and you got a 2% improvement in equal error rate, relative, but a 10% degradation on the area under the curve, then mm, maybe you shouldn't do that, right? The equal error is just one operating point. And it's very common to see papers that just measure one metric, they get 5% relative improvement, the paper goes out, you try to replicate it, no gain whatsoever. And you don't know what went wrong. Something went wrong, and it's very hard to tell in general. So just to support Guillermo's <laughs> uh, final note, don't go for the publication. Go for solid scientific improvements. The publications will come, maybe harder. If you're doing things right, it may be harder to get publications, but they will be more meaningful. Uh, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Luciana. So uh, let's. Oh, ha we have time for a couple of questions before the break. Uh, Luciana, you choose the people. <laughs> There's one over there. I don't see any hand. Where? <coughs> yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Juan from Universidad Santa Maria in Chile. So my question is that uh, you shown an example of the ResNet being bad calibrated. <laughs> But I wonder if what happened in other architectures of neural networks, I mean, is that a common behavior in any over-parameterized soft output neural network? I can't really say any, but we've seen that happen in other architectures completely different from ResNet. So if you see the paper, look at it, because it's, it has a nice analysis of what is going on. So um, batch norm, dropout, there are many things that are causing this miscalibration. Um, and it's a combination of everything. And it, it is happening more and more with more complex architectures that tend to overfit more. And that's OK, because they work better. But just be aware that the outputs of these networks, they cannot be interpreted as posteriors. That's the only issue. They, they are really great approaches. It's something to consider. That's it. All right, so let's take one more from the floor and then we'll take an online one. You want to scream and I'll repeat. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay, so thanks for the talk. First, I think it was great. Are you aware of any calibration issues in regression problems? Because as far as I have seen, the talk was regarding classification. Yeah, I, I, it's not my topic, but I, I think yes. I recently read when I was reviewing stuff for this paper that there are some work on calibration of, uh, yeah, for regression. Don't ask me more than that. <laughs> I can search for the reference if you want. Valid. Thanks. <laughs> 
So uh, we're going to take now one uh, from online, and I use the chance to say hi to people from Rio and Galicia. They were chatting, so, and they, they, like, they liked a lot the last two talks. So the talk is, uh, the, the question is, can, can you recommend some uh, uh, other resources for learning more about calibration? I, I mean, There's a bunch of references throughout the talk. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that is the authority in, in calibration for speaker recognition, which is a task that really requires calibration to be good because it's used sometimes for forensic uses. So uh, Nico Brumer, let me see if I find one of the references. He has a, a bunch of papers and his thesis is on this. So uh, that's a good place to start. His papers are sometimes hard to read uh, because they are very mathematical but it's worth the time. So this is one for multi-class calibration. Otherwise, just look at his website. He has a bunch of stuff. There's also Daniel Ramos that works a lot on, this, um, on these issues. I think there's a reference from him too. And there's older stuff. So there's a bunch of papers. Sadrosny, which will be here, I think, giving a talk. She started or one of the ones that started with this issue. Oh, well, I won't find it. But yeah. there's a reference from her, too. Yeah, she's giving a talk on Friday. Great. Yeah, we're, we're going to put the slides online, so all these references will be uh, available for you. So we take the last question, and then we go for the coffee break. One more here from the audience. Well, the, the unbalanced, she asked about what unbalanced data sets. The, what happens with unbalanced data sets is that you usually use tricks to compensate for that, and that changes the prior. So that's the issue that I mentioned, that once you tamper with the data, even if, you, if your training data was actually reflective of wild conditions to begin with, which happens sometimes when, when the data is unbalanced, it's because you have actually collected it from the wild. So you may trust those priors, but then when you tamper with the objective functions so that you balance the data, then the posteriors that the model outputs are no longer representative of what you will see in the wild. So you have to do this trick of getting rid of the prior that you fed for training so that you have something that then you can reweight with the proper prior, the one that you care about. All right, thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, be before thanking the speaker, just one comment. There's some seating area in w where the booths are, so if you, if you go in there, there are places to sit uh, during the coffee break. So let's uh, thank Luciana for the great talk again.